Hi, I'm Major Jonathan Barber. Here at Over the Horizons, we focus on the emerging security environment. If you go to the website, you can read articles, listen to podcasts, and watch interviews that talk about the emerging trends shaping the future. It talks about the breakneck speed of technology and how that's fundamentally changing how individuals interact, how governments interact, and how countries interact. We kind of take all of this and look at it through a lens or a paradigm, a framework, to decide what kind of capabilities do we need to produce? How should we react to adversaries? How should we co-opt friends? Uh, some of these paradigms are outdated. Uh, some of them we know they're outdated and we need to change them. Some of them we don't know they're outdated and that's dangerous. Uh, all of this put together exponentially increases the risk as we go forward to the decisions that we make and the directions that we take as a nation and as a group of nations. There's one thing, however, in all of this that doesn't change, and that's human nature. It's, we know that we all have a mind, a will, and emotion, and we've seen through history that humans have a great capacity for evil and they have a great capacity for good. To harness that good and to bring it out, uh, for humans to meet the improbable or the impossible and to overcome it uh, for good takes leadership, takes teamwork, takes character, and it takes uh, the right value-based system that you ground all that on. If you listen to General Quast's uh, video in, in his interview, he talks about how there's still heroes among us and there's still a great need for heroes. Uh, they're often not people who stand out as much as they're great leaders and they're great teammates that help do all this and, and make it happen. One of those heroes is with us here today. His name is Gene Krantz. Uh, he was a fighter pilot back in the F-86 days, a test pilot, and then he worked for NASA as a mission commander. Throughout the Apollo program, uh, he was a mission commander, first for Apollo 1, where three of our astronauts and three of his friends burned to death on the launch pad in an in, in operational failure. Uh, he talks to us about the lessons learned from that. And then ultimately, he was the mission commander for Apollo 11, where mankind, in probably its greatest feat, put a man on the moon and returned him safely to the Earth. Uh, furthermore, it was Apollo 13. He was the mission commander, if you've seen the movie, he's the guy with the, with the vest, um, the leader of, of that whole team to take three astronauts in a stricken spacecraft, uh, abandoned in outer space with pretty much all odds against them, and safely and successfully return them to the Earth. Gene talks to us about what it took to accomplish this uh, and what it takes to take a team, put them together, to face the impossible and to overcome it. I hope you enjoy it. For well, we meet in an hour of change and challenge, in a decade of hope and fear, in an age of both knowledge and ignorance. The greater our knowledge increases, the greater our ignorance unfolds. No man can fully grasp how far and how fast we have come. But condense, if you will, the 50,000 years of man's recorded history in a time span of about a half a century. Stated in these terms, we know very little about the first 40 years, except at the end of them, advanced men had learned to use the skins of animals to cover them. Then about 10 years ago, under this standard, man emerged from his caves to construct other kinds of shelter. Only five years ago, man learned to write and use a cart with wheels. Christianity began less than two years ago. The printing press came this year. And then less than two months ago, during this whole 50 year span of human history, the steam engine provided a new source of power. Newton explored the meaning of gravity. Last month, electric lights and telephones and automobiles and airplanes became available. Only last week did we develop penicillin and television and nuclear power. This is a breathtaking pace. And such a pace cannot help but create new ills as it dispels old. So it is not surprising that some would have us stay where we are a little longer to rest, to wait, if this capsule history of our progress teaches us anything, it is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. That we shall send to the moon, 240,000 miles away, a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall, 
on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body and then return it safely to Earth. But why, some say, the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The eagle has landed. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone. And therefore, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. So, Mr. Krantz, where were you when you saw that speech, and what went through your mind? The uh, speech, the, the impact was almost immediate because one month prior to the speech, we had blown up our second Atlas rocket. Uh, we launched Alan Shepard two weeks earlier, and uh, so we had a total of 20 minutes manned space flight experience. We'd never been to orbit, and we were uh, challenged by President Kennedy to go to the moon. And uh, for the first few days, it was just, this guy just doesn't understand. But then, I think it came not only to myself, but to the entire uh, team at the Space Task Group, that, my God, this guy trusts us. Look at, look at what he is asking us to do. We're going to go to the moon, but we've got to learn, and we've got to master all aspects of spaceflight. We've got to do it within the next eight and a half years. So the, uh, the uh, challenge was, uh, it was very dramatic, but it was uh, the stimulus I, we needed, we needed, because we had been very unsuccessful in uh, 1960, roughly, uh, roughly about uh, 30 to 40 percent of our missions failed, and they, very, they failed very spectacularly. So we were just in the process of getting on track with Alan Shepard, and we were celebrating Alan, and then we get this mission to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they are hard. And those last words, I think, pretty much stated the challenge we were faced with. Now, here at Over the Horizons, we really try to focus on the next decade and the problems of the emerging security environment and how do we provide security for the American people. Um, a lot of the challenges there can sometimes seem insurmountable. <laughs> There's a lot of complexity. It's downright scary sometimes when you look at these not so unlike the 1960s. So you were faced with a seemingly impossible task. At the same time, we had social unrest. Uh, we had Vietnam starting and then and that going on. So you have some individuals um, flying in Vietnam, some individuals over there in the mud, some in, uh, in, as POWs for up to eight years. And then you had some of those same people branching off into NASA um, to create a team to face that insurmountable task. So could you tell us, what did you guys do to forge a team to try to, to do this, um, to take the kind of risks necessary, and to come together and overcome these tasks or these challenges? Yeah, the, uh, the, the most important aspect we had, we're in a uh, significantly different environment than we are today. Uh, the majority of the uh, US members of the U.S. Congress basically were warriors that finished with uh, World War II in Korea. The media, we didn't have Fox or CNN or any of those instant news networks, so we had time to really pull our thoughts together and, and tell the story. And the media in particular was uh, very, uh, very forceful, but uh, very honest. And the entire space program, which was, uh, which was one of the greatest challenges, was basically totally open to the public. And this is one thing that we had to get used to I, uh, in mission control. I could look over my shoulder and I could see the news commentators from radio, TV, and uh, newspapers. Uh, we'd have uh, press conferences after each one of the missions. So, so we were now communicating what we were doing to the public, what we were doing and why. And that was one of the unifying factors is that we recognized that we were part of a much larger mission. Uh, the Cold War was very real to me. It was Cold War was real to many of the, my compatriots. Others that came in from uh, college 
Uh, they're looking at this as the greatest challenge since uh, Canberra. Basically, the president wanted to go to the moon, and we we're going to do it. So we had the, a culture of, uh, of challenge. We had the culture that led us to establish uh, the motto that we used in mission control, which is achievement through excellence. And we established the four standards, discipline, morale, toughness, and competence, or the qualities that as individuals would allow us to come together as a team. Now, the, one of the greatest aspects of the team building was in our mission preparation work. We spent uh, roughly about a third of our time in preparation for each one of the space missions, developing our overall risk strategy. We can call it the mission roles where we would take and, take and decompose every one of the spacecraft systems, what could happen in that thing for every phase of the mission. Uh, this would basically emerge from the lower level. We'd give them the overall strategy relative to how far we wanted to press, how we wanted to use the redundancy, but then they would start giving us the piece parts. And this debate between the flight directors and the team members really allowed us to come to a very complete understanding of the issues that we face, the risks, and also the benefits as we step forward into the unknown. Uh, the mission roles, we then continued the communications with the astronauts, the crews that we're flying. So by the time I got ready to fly, basically I knew how my controllers thought, they knew how I thought we could communicate this effectively to the crew, so and we didn't have much time to react. Uh, we knew that this uh, particular direction that we were going had been uh, very closely vetted. And basically that was the best decision we could make given the few seconds to the minutes we had to work on it. If we had a longer period of time, we knew, again, the bottom line for each one of the controllers and the crew. So the mission roles, I think, were one of the unifying processes. The, uh, I assumed I was the uh, branch chief and then division chief in flight control and uh, I had the responsibility for all the controllers that would be faced with the program. So establishing the, the uh, standardization for our training process, I couldn't get it from a contractor, so I decided to do it myself. Every product, I, I worked in aircraft flight test for two years, and when I went aboard an aircraft and we were flying an aircraft, basically I knew everything that was in that bomb bay. We were basically developing the capabilities to allow the B-52 to penetrate Soviet airspace. Well, I took the same approach in working with the members of my team. Mm -hmm. I wanted absolute, correct, concise, crisp knowledge of every one of the spacecraft systems and everything that we intended to do, and I wanted that communicated throughout the team. And as a result of the working level in preparation for a mission, we started coming together as a team. The training team we had basically was, again, a cadre of mission controllers, whose job was to defeat the flight control team. Mm -hmm. And so it was this, this what a basic antagonism that we needed to drive us to achieve the highest level of performance that was humanly possible. And we had an instructional team that was driving us to that point. And it was amazing the, uh, the scenarios that they would develop because we would come together individually, flight controller, flight director, but I also had to bring the astronauts in. So it was a question, by the time we got ready to fly, we were capable of making 100% correct, short-term, crisp decisions that basically acknowledged the risk we had. We also acknowledged the gain from each one of those steps that we would take. So it was a continual process of translating risk versus gain. Uh, for instance, during Apollo 13, uh, the real challenge was I had the opportunity to do a direct abort, come back into the Earth's atmosphere, and be back home within a day and a half. But to do that, I'd go from a very risky plateau where I was embedded in a serious problem, and I would have to move into a perform a maneuver that if I didn't do this perfectly, there was a good chance I'd impact the moon. So it was a question of making the decision to buy time and the trust I had in my lunar module team that I said, I know these guys, I know the spacecraft, I'd flown it four times previously, we will find a way to bring this crew home. And that was basically the thought process not only permeated my team, it was every team that worked in mission control. One of the great aspects of it, our bosses 
came to us and said, how can we help you? They let us carry the ball. They knew we were the best qualified to do that thing. And they were on the job, I mean, figuring out some way to allow us to have the freedom without, they'd cover the media for us. They'd cover the headquarters people up in Washington. They were our blocking backs that allowed us to carry the mission off. So you're talking about, it sounds like you have an organization with a lot of trust, which enables great communication amongst all the diverse perspectives, which give you a solution and also a capacity to handle uh, the unknown or emergencies or uh, rapid decision making. How, what are some of the things as a leader, as a mission controller, that you helped enable that kind of an organization? Well, I believe, we're, I believe teamwork starts at the very top. You need uh, a known leader. You, ha you have to be... You have to carry a reputation for it. Your reputation basically is your entry into team building. And once you carry that reputation into the team and can establish the trust, then you can work together to develop a set of values that then you can apply across the entire membership base in your team. So it's goes leadership, trust, values, and teamwork. And once you get to that final stage, you can literally do anything. And this is true. You uh, mentioned uh, Vietnam earlier. I had uh, military personnel in the early years detailed from the MOL program, Man Orbiting Laboratory program, all the way through the Gemini program. And as we moved into Apollo, uh, basically I had another cadre that we're preparing actually for uh, developing a team for the Air Force to actually carry mission operations, manned mission operations in space. And uh, many of them were aviators, and a good portion of them, as the war he heated up over there, uh, they basically were recalled and uh, basically moved to active duty again. So we had a very close relationship to the people that had been working with us that were now fighting the battles overseas, which is uh, uh, really, I think it was, it was a difficult time for many of us because we knew what they were facing over there. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had our job, and we are both fighting a war. We were fighting for the war in space they were fighting over in uh, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say, well, you're talking about leadership, and it starts there. And then you get down to values. Uh, America's been incredibly blessed in that we're very materially wealthy. Uh, we've been wealthy in experience, wealthy in knowledge, our society. But when we talk, we don't talk as much, it seems today, about being wealthy in character, wealthy in values. Mm -hmm. uh, something we all know is important, though. What are some of those values that you as a leader or that you as a team that you're trying to embed to make sure that those are there to enable everything else? I believe one of the, uh, the singular event that I believe uh, moved the teams in mission control from damn good to excellence came about as a result of the Apollo 1 fire. Uh, I had worked in flight tests. Several of the flight directors I had had been uh, military aviators. I had been a military aviator. And, uh, but many of the young people we had had never gone through that kind of a trauma to lose a crew and listen to our crew die and hear their final seconds. And it was, uh, I called uh, my team. I had roughly about 300 people at that time, my division together. And basically it talked about the nature of flight tests, the nature of risk, and what it would take to succeed. And uh, identified that uh, the day of this fire, none of us, we could have called off that test. The people at the Cape could have called it off. The crew could have called it off. No one assumed the responsibility to take the action to say, this is not the day we should press on with this test. We're not ready. And I uh, wrote two words, put two words in the vocabulary, tough and competent. Tough meaning we always assume responsibility for whatever actions we take whether we take them or whether we avoid taking them. And in the case of the Apollo 1 fire, we could have shut down that countdown, or we didn't, competent. We assume that operations a 100% oxygen environment is safe. That is not true, okay? We had stopped learning. We had stopped understanding the nature of this environment work. And from now on, the teams and mission control will be perfect. And I told my people to write those two words, tough and competent, on their blackboard and they would not be erased until we had completed the Apollo program. So I think that there are certain events that provide the opportunity. In my office, you talk about risk earlier. I had uh, basically the pictures of the missions where we weren't good enough. 
Okay, I had the Apollo 9, where basically we darn near lost Gene Cernan during an EVA. I had pictures of the early Atlas explosions that we had. I had problems associated with the Apollo 13 spacecraft. So basically, I looked at these, and there was a constant reminder that our business is managing risk and doing it to the best possible, in the best possible fashion we can. We wrote a set of standards that we call the Foundations of Mission Control. It talks about discipline, morale, toughness, competence, commitment, teamwork. But it had one statement in there that was very applicable to the young people we had, new, new people coming in the, into the organization, that said to always be aware that suddenly and unexpectedly you may find yourselves in a role where your performance has ultimate consequences. And this was, I think, very important for the new people coming in because I always thought, well, I can, uh, I can, somebody above me is going to make that decision, but that isn't the way it is. It's I wanted you, the new employee we got, to really accept this responsibility from the day you start training until the day you're fully operational. Uh, so the Foundations of Mission Control is a series of statements that we carried all the way through the program, and it lasted for almost 50 years. And finally, after the Columbia accident, we added one more element to that foundation is called vigilance because basically we should have been on top of the problems that we had in a, a Columbia mm -hmm. accident when we had that debris hit uh, much earlier and got on top of it and maybe taken some different direction. One thing we talk about in the military quite a bit, our senior leaders talk about, is the ability to take risk. So it's easy to become a risk averse you know, <laughs> organization. It's easy for NASA to become a very risk averse uh, organization. How you guys were allowed to take a lot of risk. You were allowed to fail. We talk about being allowed to fail, mm -hmm. but how do how do you turn that failure into into success later on? And then, what does it mean to be allowed to fail? You know, how do you think the senior leaders connect with the operators to do that? The uh, first of all, you have to accept the fact that risk is the price of progress. I don't care whether you're trying to make money in the stock market or you're trying to put a man in space. It has a, an element of risk that if you want to move forward, you have to accept that. And the key thing is, is to accept the responsibility personally that I am going to sign up for this and I am going to communicate what I am willing to do to my people and get them to come in and share this. Risk, risk, the management of risk, I look at in today's world as a team process because as fast as we're moving with the technologies we've got, with all the very rapid decisions, uh, very few people are capable of making the 100% correct decision all the time. So it's really a question of embedding that responsibility within the members of your team. And mission control, basically, I had a team in there and my principal job, my greatest lesson that I had learned through the training process is to become a good listener. Uh, I would make, I would get ahead of my team, I'd make decisions that I should have had them make. And that is, uh, that is demeaning, it defeats the purpose of building a team. So uh, the training, uh, the instructors we had uh, singled me out and uh, taught me some very uh, uh, rugged lessons. Uh, I'm a Catholic and uh, in uh, mission control, uh, our debriefings always start off at the very top level where you have to explain what you did and why you did it and identify where you were deficient in doing that. Uh, that is a good element of the team building because if the team sees you owning up to your own deficiencies, they will open up and start discussing them also. And as a result, other people will say, hey, I had the same problem. I can come in. Let's Let's start working together. When that guy, I can see and I can hear he's overloaded, I'm going to jump in and give him a bit of a hand. So I think that the, the process of training, the debriefing missions, assuming the personal responsibilities uh, that go with risk taking, are I think very important in being able to succeed in a high risk environment. Uh, we're fortunate because we had a very clear mandate in mission control, the flight director's job no ambiguity to take any actions necessary for crew safety and mission success. We knew as flight directors that there was no one above us. Okay, that was our job and we had been given the job and it would be supported by our top level management. 
And I believe this was true as we went down into the ranks. Each one of my systems controllers on the console had the responsibility for giving me a 100% correct definitive answer to whatever problems we were faced in there, addressing the known risks of that path that he would recommend. Uh, the training process was very rugged, very realistic. And by the time we got ready to fly, we knew each other personally. We were a relatively small team. We were like one of the ones that you look for the special operators. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, we had that kind of relationship in there. Uh, I had a uh, mission where one of my controllers was involved in an automobile accident. I had a, a flight surgeon who basically was Canadian. He basically had uh, taken care of Canadian hockey players after the game. So I set him out, so he jumped in there. But the, the, the team relationship was really the ultimate key to our success combined with the ability that we were given, the challenge, the responsibilities we were given by our management. There seldom did we ever get overruled uh, by our leadership. One of the other things that was interesting in mission control is the flight directors always came from the ranks of the teams. For over 50 years, every flight controller was selected from membership in the team. And you do this because you want an individual with a good decision track record. You want an individual capable of coping with the stress. You want an individual who can build a team. You want an individual who's a good listener. You want an articulator because when times get tough, you know, when we went down to the moon, uh, I had the responsibility for that landing. And my final words to the team as we had acquisition spacecraft, then we came into this room as a team and we will leave as a team. I will stand behind every decision you will make. And that was a very difficult uh, period because one of my controllers was faced with a series of computer program alarms that were totally unexpected. And he had to make the calls to say, we're go to continue. And he made them right on track. And it was recognizing the significance, that the importance of the work that he was doing, but in particular, his role in this decision process and accepting the risk to make that decision. Uh, it was, uh, I think, an incredible time in the life of many of the controllers to experience this. The uh, space program, uh, none of the missions were ever easy. And probably one of the most uh, important missions we ever faced was Apollo 14. We were getting ready to go down to the moon, and we we're in a final pass around the front side of the moon. And one of my controllers sees he has a board indication in his console. Uh, that shouldn't be there. If the engine had been armed, that would have been a bad day. Checks with his back room. It's a valid telemetry bit. Goes to the flight track and say, flight, will you have the astronaut hit the abort switch with the flashlight? And the abort indication went away. And we now had two hours, one more opportunity to go down to the moon. And he led the development of a software patch to bypass that abort switch during engine start and then re-enable it once the engine was started. And the thing was, our management, our leadership, let us take that kind of a risk. Uh, the business of uh, risk has to be shared. There's no one individual that has to be accepted in a, as a community, as a team. And uh, leadership, top level leaders, eventually I left the uh, flight director's council, I was, became the flight operation director. Basically, I accepted the risk that they were going to accept the risk. So it's really, I would support them because they were my team. What do you think, so you've given us great ideas of bringing a team together. What are some of the things, the biggest enemies of that? What are the things that tears the team apart? <laughs> I think the greatest enemy is what they call ego. And many of us came in from aircraft flight test and basically we had to learn to check our ego at the door every day when we came to work. Uh, that, was, that was one of the aspects. The other thing was recognition that basically uh, you are only a small part of this venture, like going to the moon or whatever job that you're given in life. Uh, I think uh, it's really accepting the fact that this, in today's world, is a team-related job. It's a team decision because things are moving fast. I think the other one is, is not doing enough homework. I used to... Uh, spend a good portion of my every day coming back, coming home from work, and really preparing myself for the next day's job. It was uh, basically a self-recognition self of the, my own deficiencies, and like I say, 
Mine was one of being ahead of my team, not making them, not training them to make the decisions. And then uh, getting to the point where I was able to visualize actually what the crew's role in this thing was, how they fit into this thing, and basically uh, make a decision that looked at it as a total team. If I move in this direction, is the crew capable of implementing this thing? Are they going to have any questions? How do I make sure that in the few seconds that we got to talk, that they are going to execute what our best call is? And this is this was true during powered flight. We had roughly around 20 seconds. And basically, as a trained team, we could uh, make a 100% correct decision in 20 seconds. We had That was enough time. It's a lifetime in mission control. Mm -hmm. It's a lifetime in, in uh, many aspects, uh, professional aspects. It's a lifetime in the, those people operate as special operators or air combat controllers. 20 seconds uh, for a well-prepared team, uh, you can get an awful lot done. What could you tell us about as we do go forward, and there's a lot of changes that are gonna happen to the world over the next 10 years. There's a lot of changes that are gonna happen in space uh, over the next 10 to 20 years. From a commercial point of view and from a military point of view, uh, where do you see the way forward is for us? First of all, I'm, uh, I'm very bullish in space. I believe that uh, to a great extent, uh, the books have been written on how to accomplish various things in space, the technology is there. We've got generations of young people capable of stepping up and accepting and being successful and living in a high-risk environment. Uh, the major challenge that we need is to get the kind of leadership component that is going to allow us to do this. I believe what the change administration, and I know several of the people up in Washington, that they're now looking back at what I consider the, the next step from a standpoint of exploration was to go back to the moon. And I believe a lot of people have been uh, talking Mars, 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 but basically that's far out and it's very easy to say, yes, we support Mars, and it becomes nothing but a PowerPoint presentation. You don't have to commit money to it. You can just study, 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 study. Where the moon, you can set an objective to be there in five years six years, and I think you could do it. I think the great difficulty that both the commercial and, uh, and the NASA space, the military space operators, is to build the team. It's easier to build the hardware than it is to build the team that is capable of properly exercising that hardware. So I think team building is the greatest challenge that, uh, that we face looking towards the future. Once you get that team ready, what you need is this person who is capable of articulating the program and selling it to the public. I believe that if, as we go further into exploration, like the International Space Station right now, it's going to be an international project. I believe that to a great extent it's going to be still focused by the United States because we're the ones that have the technology, the economic, and the leadership base to allow that to happen. Uh, the commercial entities, I'm, I'm really amazed at how successful that they have been uh, when I started off in the space program, EVA was incredibly difficult. I did the second EVA with Gene Cernan. We almost lost him. But now you can see the crewmen outside the spacecraft with the robotics, working cooperatives, assembling a space system that had never been physically mated on Earth gives you an opportunities when you look towards the future. How do I want to go to the moon? Well, maybe I can assemble the systems to go to the moon or to the Mars in space. Mm. We've got automated docking. The technology is, is, is incredible. I was in mission control uh, just watching the uh, space station, the International Space Station operation. And I'm dazzled at, at their ability to do things that, that we could only dream of decades earlier. I mean, this, this, is, this, this is the future. And it is important that we recognize that we have to keep moving forward. We have to take the risks to be bold, take big steps, and I believe exploration is one of those steps that is necessary because as a nation, risk is the price of progress, but also difficult missions force the emergence of new cutting edge technology. And I believe that as a nation, we're going to be able to provide for the economic, we're gonna provide the economic foundation of our nation through high technology that is not easily replicated. So basically, I believe that space has many reasons. We've got to inspire the young people to sign up for science, technology, engineering, and math. So there's all kinds of reasons to go into space, but I believe that is ex exploration is part of human nature. We want to challenge boundaries. We want to challenge ourselves. We want to challenge our organization. 
And I believe we are capable of doing that, and I'm looking forward to the coming years. Uh, when, I, uh, when I finished, I was flight director for the final launch off the surface of the moon. And I believed in my lifetime I would see Americans back on the moon again. I don't think that's, I won't see it. I'm too old right now. But I can only pray now that my children and their children's children will again see America plant our flag on the surface of the moon. And to drive the point home, how many computers did you guys have when you uh, <laughs> were doing Apollo 11? Putting you know, you know was it, that's interesting. The, uh, the, uh, when we started off in, in Gemini, uh, we had the first uh, solid-state computers ever developed by IBM, and they didn't trust us to operate and have them in mission control. They put them 700 miles north of the Cape yeah. at Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, our communications. Backup communications was Morse code. Right. So basically, we were, had to be as adept at Morse code as we were in the spacecraft systems. Uh, the computer that we went down to the surface of the moon with was a 64K machine, 16K erasable, one cubic foot in volume, and weighed 70 pounds. Yeah. Try to carry that around in your <laughs> wrist there. Right. So this is, a, a, the technology is there, the people are there, uh, everything you need is, is ready. What we need is somebody to say, let's go. Yeah. And the one thing that hasn't changed is, is human nature and the capability of humans uh, to come together to, to display values, leadership, come together as a team and accomplish the impossible. So I think there's so many lessons we can take from the amazing accomplishments that you and that, that group of people at NASA accomplished. Um, and that your generation kind of showed us. So we really appreciate that. Thanks so much for coming, talking to us. Um, really enjoyed it, and it's an honor to have you, sir. Great. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, sir. Have a good one. Thank um, you. Come uh, to join us at overthehorizonmdos.com for more conversations on the emerging security environment and how we can handle it. Thanks for joining us.